Free the real, man. This is Young Williams. We got Eric Hicks. Shout out to the First Street crew. You know something, brother? I I look at it like this here. And, it, and this even applied to the, you know, to the youngers that's out on the street today. A man, a young man, we only as good as our options. So, you know, it's like people ask us, some, you know, like, uh, why did you do this? Why did you do that? And I asked them, like, did you come up in the inner city? Do you know what it's like? To be 14, 15, 16, and to see that level of poverty and not have access to any kind of uh, wealth, any kind of riches, like you, you're going to do whatever you have to do to make ends meet. So, so you know, and, and this is why, you know, like for, for young kids now, if they really want to pull them off the street, then you got to, you, you you have to amplify their options. They gotta have options. We didn't have options. So, you know, for me, it was simple. Um, I can go to school, I continue to wait until some money down the line. But, what, but in the meanwhile, my family's suffering. And so I'm taking the options that was available to me in that moment. And, you know, and it, do it make it right? It don't make it right. But the thing is this though, you know, for people who judge us, I would say, you know, how about the, the the individuals who who uh who may be quote unquote rich and who evade paying taxes for years? It's a crime. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> it's a crime. So I mean, this look, uh, Trump ain't paid taxes for years, but you know they say, oh, you know that's a crime. But the thing is, is that you know, but we are always judged differently, though. You know. I appreciate that answer too, man. You know what I mean? I didn't know how you was gonna answer that, but that was perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so uh, when the fans finally came for, you know, your group, you know, how was that mm -hmm. for you? Ooh. Um, You know, that time was crazy, Eon, because it's like people, well, when they, when, when they, when they initially came to grab us, right? You know, the funny part about it is, is that they didn't technically, they didn't even have warrants. So I remember being around First Street that night in 92. And when they came, man, they came, they they were the helicopters and every fucking thing. I went, listen, I don't even know how the fuck I got away. I got away that night. I got away. Uh, uh, doing when you say they was the helicopters, what, what it was like, a, a dragnet? Well, what they did was they cordoned off the entire First Street neighborhood. So they surrounded everything, right? And through all of that, you know, because I'm, you know, I'm born and raised around it. So I'm like, well, I know the cuss. They don't know the cuss. So, so the feds, you know, they were in helicopters and then they were in cars. They actually rolled right past me because I was standing, I wasn't on First Street. I was on the side street. So they rolled right past me. So when, when we saw them, we thought that they was a stick up boy at first. We're like, damn, who the fuck is that? So, so they rolled right past us, but my wheels turned us from like, ah. So, so, and, and so when, by the time they got to the top of the block, when we looked back down to the bottom, all you seen was feds running up the street. So, but because the street was dark, I was able to, you know, I was able to slide off. Now, I was the only one around there that night. Uh, Doomy, he was in the area, but I was the only one right there. Like Tony and all of them, they was, they was like out and about. Everybody had common sense except me. You know what I'm saying? I'm the only, I'm the only dude that's still coming through first week knowing that it's coming. So, um, but, but, so I didn't get caught that night. Uh, I, I, don't, I got caught like a month later. Uh, you know, uh, Tony and Ronald, they, uh, they got caught, uh, after, uh, no, Danny got caught second. Doomy got caught that night, but they had to let him go. Um, uh, then they got caught second, and then uh, and then Tony Ronald, they actually uh, they got caught last. Cause I remember when I was coming back from court, and the guys told me, "Oh man, you know they got your man's name on the news, man." And I'm like, "Oh man, you know uh, I wanted them to run it out because if yeah. I, you know, because if I could, I would have took everything, you know." Yeah, yeah, honorable, honorable. Let me ask you this: I've never had an indictment like that, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but through 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 my experience in prison and in the law library, when those charges come, a lot of time you don't even know what you're charged with at first. So, what was that experience like? You're over the jail, you know it's the feds. When do you really know the severity of what you're facing? Well, you know the beautiful part of it, brother, is this: because see, a lot of people don't remember. You know, when they first start locking up the crew, the gangs and stuff, or what they call gangs, they really call them crews. 
<laughs> a lot of people don't remember they came to Wall 5 first. They crushed Wall 5. So they went from uh they, they went from Orleans, which you know, which, which was Ravel and all them. They went to Osby, which was Nugent and them, and then they came to P Street, then they came back to us. So they so they actually grabbed four of the first five crews that they arrested was from Wall Five. Okay. So, so you know, like we were able to see what happened to Ray and them. Then we were able to see what happened to, you know, to News and the Black and all them. So, you know, we watching all them get life in real time. So, you know, so by the time we go to trial, <clears throat> we we recognize that we got them. We got the same charges they got. So we already know what it's hidden for. We know that if we lose, we going to get life. But, you know, but that's that's part of what you sign up for. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But But we knew because of what happened to them. Okay, so uh, when the indictment comes, you know, is there anything on the indictment that surprises you? Like, you know, you prepare, how, how does that process go for you while you're sitting over the jail? I, I think what was the most surprising part for us was that, you know, was that they they they, they chose to charge me and Tony as kingpins, right? Uh, that was the most surprising thing. I thought that, you know, they would probably charge us with rack of turn, you know, the RICO Act. But then when they put, you know, the see like um the CCE, that's you know, that's the Kingpin statute, but it got two parts to it. The first part 848. Exactly. Exactly. That's 848. So it got two parts to it. It got uh the regular part, which carries a mandatory minimum of 20 years, and then it got quote unquote the bad nigga part. The bad nigga part carry life without the possibility of parole. So, so that's B. Uh, that's B. Exactly. They charge us with the bad nigga pop. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, you know, um, for us, you know, it was just like, damn, you know, uh, shit. January '87, I was 16. Tom was 13. So I'm like, damn, yeah, that's how y'all occurring this. But how did how, how do they get away with that though? Y'all don't want to sidetrack us too much, but even in my mind, like I used to research it. I used to be like, bro, if you do the math, I told myself you were 16. I say Tone was 13. So what well, what well, Ronald was 11? Exactly, 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 exactly. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? So I think the jury, you know, I think, it, well, let me let me say this. They get away with it because the way, you know, judges, judges to me, they are political creatures. Uh, they, they're political creatures because federal judges, they are appointed by presidents. So if you know that your president has an agenda, you know, of, of uh, being, uh, you know, quote, unquote, uh, you know, like a... Uh, a, a law and order man or a man that's hard on crime, and you want to interpret the laws that gives him as much leeway as possible. So, but the Kingpin statute, it wasn't made to be applied the way that it was applied to us, meaning that that um, if I stand on the street corner and I sell crack for four or five years, you know, through aggregated sales or whatever, and they add up. But that's not what the that's not what the kingpin statute is for. Like the kingpin statute is really, you know, for the individuals who are are, are well, supposed to be, you know, the people that are, are are bringing stuff in, you know, or people that are moving, you know, these vast quantities. And but the way that the judges chose to interpret the law, and the way that the prosecutors, because the prosecutors now they sit back and you know you have these minds, they sit here and say, well, hey. If the court interpreted this law, you know, so that we can do this, then hey, why don't we try this? And 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 when they, you know, when they tried it, because we were the youngest guys in the area, probably in the United States, to be charged as kingpins, and they got away with it. And you know, so when they got away with it, you know, it opened up the door. Now it's almost like you can you can get away with that with anybody, you know? So 
uh, the, you know, the, 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 the blessing, if you want to even call it a blessing, is that the jury chose not to convict us of it because I think that they sat here and they looked at us in some of the pictures that they had in the courtroom and they're like, oh, you know, this is them in 88. We look like fucking, like we was babies. We was babies. They looking like, huh? King P. You know, so, but little did they know that even if they didn't reach a verdict, the guilty, you know, uh, on the kingpin statue, little did they know that they already had other means to backdoor us and send us as if you know as if we was kingpins anyway. Through the sentencing guidelines, exactly. How does that scheme work? Oof. Um, the sentencing guidelines. <laughs> I should have thrown in my side for years, bro. You know because you know just imagine somebody coming to you, Leon, and and you know and and let's say. You go out, you shoot somebody, right? And, um, you know, and, and they say, well, you know, Eon, you was running, you know, with this drug crew over here, you shot this dude. And so, you know, so they charge you with doing it uh, and say, you know, you shot this dude to protect your conspiracy. Mm -hmm. When the jury say, well, we don't think Eon did that. So we're going to acquit him of that. So now, so you've been acquitted of this murder and purpose of the drug conspiracy, but guess what? They have a sentencing enhancement that that allows you to be sentenced for murder and furtherance of a drug conspiracy. But this time, you don't have to be found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The, the government is allowed this time to prove their case by a preponderance of the evidence, the lowest standard of proof in criminal law. So now when you get the sentencing, you're wondering, how in the hell can I be sentenced for something that the jury said that I didn't do? And, and this is what the guidelines, you know, the guidelines allow all of these different factors that are really, you know, things that the jury should find, like how much drugs you had, uh, whether or not you was a leader, whether or not you killed somebody. The guidelines allow the government to still make these arguments at sentencing under a lower standard of proof. So now... You know, people get accustomed to hearing reasonable doubt. A lot of people don't even know what the hell preponderance of the evidence is. You know, uh, but when you but but when it affects your life, the way that it affects you know the federal defendants, you know very well what it is. And um, and so you know that's what the guidelines are. You know, the guidelines once you get convicted for like a conspiracy, so they say, well, okay, the jury convicts you of a conspiracy that involves no weight of a crack. They say, well, we just found that uh, Mr. Eon distributed uh, a detectable amount. That could be a dime. That could be a 20. But now when you get to sentencing, the government stopped bringing in all these other, you know, uh, all this other stuff. And now it goes from you distributing uh, 10, 20 dollars of crack to you distributing 10, 15 keys. Mm. And that's not proven beyond a reasonable doubt because the guidelines allow these findings to be made under preponderance of the evidence. So, you know, um, I mean, you try to explain, you know, like the, the guidelines in layman terms, uh, it's, you know, that's probably like one of the easiest definitions that I could give is, you know, imagine that you have been acquitted of murder, but uh, but when you get to sentencing under the federal sentencing guidelines, you can still be sentenced for it because those guidelines, especially now that they're advisory, um, they will, you know, those, they, to say that, that <laughs> man, bro, you know, people don't even know to have, man. They don't know to have. And uh, and I wish that that people really understood exactly what those guidelines were. And this is why I, I, I find myself disenchanted, you know, when you hear a lot of these people who are out here and they talking about states' rights. And I'm like, well, if you if you're talking about states' rights and you're saying the federal government shouldn't have X amount of power. So now, so you should be very angry about the federal government being able to to pretty much commandeer sentencing proceedings in the feds and 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 sentence you for you know for all kinds of stuff that don't you know that don't have to be included in your indictment as the Sixth Amendment says that as a citizen you should have. And the jury never hears it too, right? Well, yeah, then we'll, and that's another point is that, like, you know, there was this dude out of Baltimore, right? Uh, you know, this was during the 90s because, you know, like, fentanyl has been around for a while. So so in the 90s, uh, these guys from Baltimore, they had a conspiracy. And so what happened, like, in this little neighborhood they were in, uh, you know, people had overdosed. 
So uh, the government wanted to argue that uh, that these guys sold uh, this fentanyl, and and uh, and and and, uh, uh, and and that it led to the deaths of these people. Now the judge said, "Well, I can't allow that. I can't allow that in trial because that would be prejudicial." So the judge said, "I'll tell you what. Uh, you know, we'll 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 kick the ball down the road." Now what happened was the guys wind up getting convicted of this, you know. Um, conspiracy to distribute uh, heroin and fentanyl. But then when they got the sentencing, the government came and said, hey, you know, all of these people died in this area. We want you to sentence them for these people's deaths. So they enhanced their sentences up to life, even though this stuff was never deemed admissible during the trial. Yeah, that's a perfect example. I'm glad you went there. Mm -hmm. uh, not getting off track. I'm still, uh, I'm still on, I'm still at the jail. So I want to touch on one thing that a lot of guys, you know, a lot of times when people get an opportunity to talk to guys like you, you know, you know, you know what they want to talk about. I'm not going to even say all that, <laughs> but <laughs> but I want to know, you know, what type of like, like stress and burden that all this pre-trial pressure put on you and your family. You know, what was it like over the jail? You know, visits behind the glass, you know, you, you left kids on the street. Like, what was all that like for you? Wow figuring out if you go going to jail for the rest of your life. Well, you know, yeah, well, you know, one thing I tell guys is this, you know, like, like for all of us, I'm not going to say it wasn't stressful, but you know, uh, man, we stay high a lot. You know, that's like, that's one way to combat it. You know, like we smoked our weed and, you know, but, um, but, you know, another thing is, is that, you know, back then, you know, we live by real codes. I mean, in code, when I say live by codes, meaning that back then, you know, no matter where you was from, you know, in D.C., we held each other accountable, man. So so you understood that, you know, when, when, when these charges come, that cooperating, it's, it's not an option. You know, it's not an option because, for one, you know, you pride yourself in being a man, you know? So it makes it kind of difficult, you know, when, 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 when you see your family out there, you know that you're not there, but, you know, you, you still dealing with the minds of, of very young men. So we don't really realize the impact of everything that happened until years later. All we knew in that moment was, look, we got we to gotta close ranks. And we got to fight these people. So our mind was focused on the fight. You know, you're going to try, you know, um, because me and Tony had already beat the Fed. We think, hey, man, you know, lightning might strike twice. We might beat them again. But, you know, it's, it's, it's hard for you to really focus on what's going on with your family because, you know, and, and that's even all the way up until we got life. The finality of it, it don't sit in, you know, in, in your mind. Your mind don't really grasp that because, you know, technically speaking, you know, you you have a very young mind, so you so you're not really thinking about the stress of your family or leaving a kid behind, leaving a baby mother behind. You don't really think about that in the moment because you're thinking that, hey, I'm about to fight these people. Uh, it's a possibility I'm gonna win, but if I don't win, I got this appeal coming up. So your mind don't really think about the finality of that. So you know, when you get to the jail, you that's just you know, it's to to us, you know, it was just, you know, like another part of D.C. And when you get there, you got to plant your flag in the ground and you got to make sure that, you know, the principles and values you live by, that guys respect that. Okay. So how long were you over the jail uh, in, let's say, you know, pre-trial, uh, pre-trial phase? Mm, I got to the, uh, I got to the jail in uh, October 92, right? Um, and we didn't start trial until we we started a trial like right around uh October of ninety-three. So it's like roughly a year. Uh then I uh after we got you know we was in trial for some months. We didn't we didn't finish trial until ninety-four. So um I got uh we got convicted in like January, February of ninety-four. Uh I left the jail, I wanna say around about uh probably February to March of 94. So I stayed over there for about, for about 14 months. 
What was that experience like for you? I, I've never been to trial in the federal courtroom. I went to see many homies trial, you know, it's big, you know, it gave you a different kind of feeling, uh, you know, you know, when the defense and the government and they're going at it, it's something like I never seen in Superior Court or any other courtroom. Mm -hmm. But uh what you were like 24 years old? Yeah, uh, well, yeah, when uh, by the time trial started, I was 23. Okay, 23 years old. What was that experience like in and out day for day for I think y'all went to trial for almost six months, if I ain't mistaken. Yeah, um, well, you know, for us. You know, again, you know, we just focused on, man, you know, uh, closing ranks, right? And, uh, you know, and just making sure, man, that, uh, like, there's no, like, it's no, it's no clear-cut way that you can fight a conspiracy or recall or CCE. So, you know, you just basically going in there and, you know, you doing the best that you possibly can. And, um, but, um, you know, for, for me, um, that you know, like us being in trial, it it was it, it was like a blur, man. It, you know, it, it was like a blur because you. Well, let me give you an interesting thing that happened to us, and it, this was one of the first things that opened our eyes up. We, you know, when we initially started trial, we started trial in a regular courtroom, right? Uh, the government, after we had been in trial for like maybe 10, 10 to fourteen days, um, some people yeah. got killed around first week. And yeah, that, that guy wrote everything. all them inflammatory articles about child wildlife trial. Exactly. So now, after that happened, the government came in and they wanted to have a special hearing, but they had it in the judge's chambers. So when they went back to the chambers, they said, hey, these guys are engineering the murder of witnesses who are connected to this case. We need to get this case out of this courtroom and we need to go upstairs to the ceremonial courtroom, which is the courtroom with all the bulletproof glass, because the judge at first said when we started trial, he said, "I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna take this trial up there because this is the simple trial. It's you know, it's dealing with, uh, yeah, it had the allegation of murder and drugs, but we can have this trial right here." But when the government did that, it changed his whole attitude, and then from that point on, because he was one of the more fair judges over there, supposedly anyway, but from that point on. You know, you could you could sense the you know the shift in the tenor of how everything was conducted, and just imagine the jury. You know, now you go from a regular courtroom. Now, you know, you sitting behind all this bulletproof glass, and you, you know, and they looking at us like, huh? And you know, and then you look around like, damn, you know, like we young, we don't know what the fuck a fair trial is supposed to look like, but we know this ain't it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's not it. So yeah, like that was an interesting thing that happened, and. um and the government was able to milk that cow throughout the trial, you know, uh, and, um, and, and, you know, it just changed. I won't go as far as to say that we would have won, but, um, but it, but it changed the way that uh, the lawyers had to argue, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the judge limited out our, uh, our access to our lawyers, like certain things, our lawyers, they just weren't allowed to talk to us about because the government had did such a job in convincing the judge that if you tell them about any people, these people will die. So, you know, so yeah, like our lawyers have to withhold information from us. Come on right. now. Right. All right, I ain't yeah. gonna beat that dead horse too much. You, you, you went into kind of like what I wanted to go into, but I do got two more trial questions for you. Mm -hmm. One is this, and I just want to ask you like, you know, how did this play out in court and do you you know how did it affect you when you heard this so you know I'd have read your case all different type of ways mm -hmm. and uh, correct me if I'm wrong but during your trial a woman testified to the fact that she seen through some tinted windows mm -hmm. and she was questioned how she was able to do such and mm -hmm. to my recollection her response was she had a gift from God well yeah uh, uh, and I remember that you know it's funny because me and Tony <laughs> were talking about that the other day um uh, uh the chick uh she what she said was she was she was actually testifying about uh 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 whether or not she saw uh two gunmen uh that were that, that were supposedly had uh, murdered uh, uh, an informant and she said that um uh she was standing in a cleanness. And the cleaners, you know, the window is like it's dusty, you know, oh, okay. it hadn't been cleaned. So 
you know, uh, you know, the lawyer, uh, you know, Monday is like, well, you know, I'm got a picture of this window. How did you see him? You know, like what how did that happen? And she said, Well, you know, Mr. Money, I'm not gonna lie. You know, um, I had a vision from God. Oh, that's what she said. Okay. Exactly. And so now you can see the pieces, you know, slowly falling apart because you know he grilled her on that. And uh, you know, she had I had a vision from God about the identity of a suspect. And that's just not, you know, like Hey man, it was like a shop, you know, swimming in uh fucking uh water, you know, filled with blood. Okay, all right. I just had to ask you that. And another <laughs> thing I want to ask you, I want to ask you this for a couple of young guys that I was trying to explain this to. Mm -hmm. In y'all case, I was uh I was talking to a young guy, and he was like, nah, 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 the first three dudes, man, they had 21 keys, man. 21 keys, 21 keys. Can you break down the 21 keys, not only in your case? But in every other body case all over the country, can you break down the ghost drugs and how that scheme works? Okay. This is how ghost drugs work, right? During your trial, the government, right, they technically don't have to bring in any, they don't have to bring in any physical drugs. So now, a person gets on the stand and a person says, hey, look, you know, I've done business with Eon. He sold me uh, four ounces a week for six months. Now, you know, during your trial, you don't really think about, you know, how that may impact your sentencing. But what happens is, is now, so the jury find you guilty and say, okay, well, he conspired to sell drugs. Now, when you get your PSI and you're going through the, you know, the drug quantity, they, they have these people's testimony and say, oh, well, you know, uh, John Doe said that Eon sold him four ounces a week for six months. So what the government do is they say, and we'll do a conservative estimate. We'll just say that, uh, that, 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 that uh, you know, Mr. Eon sold him, uh, we'll just say uh, 12 ounces a month. We, we won't even go the whole 16. We'll just say 12. So now you take 12 ounces and you multiply that times six, that's 72 ounces. So, so now that's technically two keys. So, so that that's drugs that never came in the courtroom. But now these are drugs that are relevant to your sentencing because you're going to be sentenced. So now just imagine if you don't have just that one person, you got five different people saying that you sold them X amount of uh, you know, uh ounces for X amount of weeks. And and the the, the probation department and the government, they tally the totals up. And they put the totals in your PSI. And when you get to sentencing, you're wondering how this conspiracy to distribute no particular amount turns into 21 keys. And that's how it happens because they do the math and they, you know, they go back to the testimony and they add up all the drug quantities from the testimony, even when there's no physical drugs. You got life without parole. Boom, it's in the Washington Post. Everybody say, uh, Tone, Erg, all Ronald, every day done, man. They got life without parole. They out of here. All the haters, all the naysayers, all the people don't understand life. Even your family, like, oh my God, they gone for life. You get on the bus, you're down to the feds. How do that psychologically hit you? The night that they came to get me, you know, to go to the feds, right? And it's funny because I was just talking to a dude a couple of days ago about this because he was in the dorm now, Ogmar with me. And he was like, oh, man, when they came and got you back, man, I remember, man, 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 all of us, was, man, man, we was messed up when they came and got you because I knew I didn't have no more court dates. So, and this was in August of 94. So uh, when they came back there, you know, we sitting in the back of the dorm, it's like one in the morning. You know, everybody high shit. You know, we sitting in the back. It's, you know, an Ahmad summit, it's hot. We got the fans blown. And uh, he say, oh, Hicks. I'm like, hey, man, we know what's going on. Uh, you know, you got caught in the morning. So I, I already knew what it was. So, uh, you know, I went around, you know, told dudes, hey, man, I'm, I'm out of here tomorrow. Now, you know, what, what, what I really didn't, you know, what I didn't know, and I don't think any of us knew, was that, you know, when we got found guilty uh, and we got sentenced, we didn't know that the Department of Justice uh, made a request to the judge and to the BOP to kick us off the East Coast for 10 years. So I didn't find that out until I got to California. When I got to California, because I went to, uh, when I left Lord that, that August, I went to um, 
I went to El Reno because Oklahoma wasn't open yet. You know, uh, you know, we, you know, when we left Lord back then, anyway, you know, we was max custody. So wherever you went, you was gonna be locked down. So I went to El Reno, I was locked down. I left El Reno, I went to Phoenix, locked down. Then they took me to some rinky dink joint in uh Seattle, I was locked down. They took me to another little rinky dink spot in uh Sacramento, I was locked down, and then I finally got the long pop, you know, uh a time later. But when I got the long pop, um I remember one of the first things that the counselor told me was, he said, man, you must have pissed somebody off. I'm like, you know, well, why you say that? He said, because they told us, you know, uh, by no means will, you know, will you be back on the East Coast uh, at any point within the next 10 years. I'm like, huh? And then, and, and, and I didn't know that we were separated. So, you know, they had us separated. So, you know, uh, it was like a, um, it was a psychological, you know, like you have to adjust you know, but look, you know, this coming from where we come from, it's like this here. You figure that, man, look, they can send me to Siberia. I'm going to be fine. You know, you just have to see it and you got to adjust yourself to it. And, you know, and you just have to know your surroundings. So, you know, when I got there, I looked around. For one, it was, you know, it was more wide open than long. So I'm like, well, shit, I'm going to make this work. You know what I'm saying? And uh, because I'm like, shit, you know, y'all got contact visits, you know, motherfuckers are ripping around the yard and shit, I'm, I'm 24. I'm about to make this shit work. You know, so psychologically, it's not, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not like the bitter pill. You haven't technically swallowed that bitter pill yet because you still know, well, I got a pill. I can possibly get back on the pill. So, you know, you just basically just in another prison in another part of the United States and you just... Ripping and running, you know, doing what a 24-year-old do during that time. So, you know, I hear a lot of stories of, uh, you know, you knowing your way around the law library, you know. Uh, how did that journey begin? You know, when did you, uh, you know, because uh, from talking to Tone and talking to other brothers like you that had these sentences, I, I, I got strength to do my little sentence, right? Yeah. So, like, how did you keep pushing? I mean, I know I've been in prison. I know it's ups and downs. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, how did you tell yourself, I don't care if it's 40 or 50 years, I'm going to get out? Like, what did you do? How did you summon that energy? I think, you know, the, the, the turning point for me was, uh, you know, they kicked all of us out of California. They said, man, pack y'all shit. You know, we don't want you motherfuckers out here no more. Because there was a little incident with the Mexicans. So they like, look, you know, pack your shit, get the fuck out. You know, so they, they locked all of us down first. You know, uh, and then... Um, you know, just sitting back in the hole during that time, I remember when the case first came out, a case called Apprendi, Apprendi versus New Jersey. I never forget, because I didn't know shit about the law, you know, but all but all I kept hearing was, you know, guys were like, man, you know, this case said a lot of us should have had them on 20 years. So, but at the time, I had my, my direct appeal and stuff was already over, so we on our 2255. So I'm telling the lawyer, I'm like, hey, you know, you think you can put this case with it? She was like, yeah, you know, this this is big, you know, like uh, I didn't know nothing about retroactivity or I didn't do nothing about nothing. You know, I'm just a typical young and ripping and running. I'm playing ball and I'm learning about making me some money in the zone. And, you know, you want to have the, the girls come see you. So. Um, when they denied my uh when when they denied my twenty two fifty five, when it really when they denied the uh when when, when the D.C. circuit. When they when when they said that hey this case is not retroactive so so you can't even use it you know even though it makes the difference possibly between you getting life and you possibly having twenty years you can't use it so at that point you know I'm I'm thinking I'm like well you know what when I get to the next spot I need to really buckle down so I while I was in the hole I started you know taking little paralegal classes right. I still didn't know shit though, because it's, you know, I'm just reading and, you know, I'm just basically passing time. Because, you know, when you're in a hole, you know, motherfuckers stay up all night. You know, motherfuckers is beating, singing, and kicking the doors. And I just wanted something to focus on so I don't become a goddamn degenerate. You know what I'm saying? So I, so, um, I started the Pearl Eagle course, and then I got up to uh, the pin up Allen World, you know, and then I finished it off. But it was the old timer there from uh from PA, you know, he used to always like to talk about the law. And I used to sit and listen, you know, and uh and I always prided myself in that, you know, if I set my mind to something, I know I could do it. So 
after, you know, uh, you know, in sitting there talking to him and learning some of these concepts and I'm learning about my pace. And I'm like, well, damn, you know, maybe I could try this. So I just went foul and crazy. I just started fouling every motherfucking thing. But everything was getting shot down because I really still didn't understand the procedure, you know, the procedural aspect of it. So I said, you know what? So I had a friend of ours send me some uh, 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 these, these habeas corpus books. These books are like $500 a piece. But when I got them books, them jumps changed my life, bro. Um, I sat there in the cell. I can remember, you know, because uh, I didn't have a celly for a lot of while I was in the Penny Island world. So I would be sitting there, man, two, three in the morning. I'm reading these books. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm man, I'm starting to get this shit. And, um, you know, uh, finally, you know, I got to the point where, you know, that's, you know, it, it was like the matrix. You know how you just see the numbers coming down? Everything started to connect. Everything. And so I'm like, man, you know what? Man, I might be good at this stuff, man. And um, and and you and and but I still couldn't understand, you know, how we got so much time if the Sixth Amendment, you know, stated that we shouldn't have got more than 20 years. So, but all of that just, you know, like it made me passionate about wanting to know as much as I could possibly know because I felt that that the window of opportunity, it was going to open again. And I said, you know what? The next time the window of opportunity open, we will not get left behind. That was my that was my vow. So what 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 point of your bid you think this revelation occurred? At that point, I had been in for about about fourteen. Okay, okay. All between, right. So you yeah, mentioned, huh? Say my fault. I had been in at, at that point between like twelve to fourteen years. Okay, you said something about everything getting shot down, and I done went through that, you know. Uh, in all actuality, for me in the beginning, I didn't care because I thought it was a lesson. How was it for you when you first began to get shot down? You get numb, you know. You 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 get numb to this stuff because you know after a while you you foul stuff with the intentions of winning, but you also come to understand that the procedural rules are real. Them rules are real, and they will apply those rules. So I used to always tell guys, look, let's not focus on what your issue is. Let's focus on whether or not we can get past these procedural hurdles. Because if you can't get past the procedural hurdles, then you don't have a claim. So, so I started looking at every way that they denied me. I'm like, that's what it is. I can't get past the procedural hurdles. So, and then, so now, now, I give you an interesting fact. In 2018, right, I finally mastered all this shit. So I, I made an argument, right? It was the only, I was the only prisoner in the United States to make this argument. I argued that my obstruction of justice, that it um that it violated the Fifth Amendment because the obstruction of justice a guideline, uh, it was it was unconstitutionally vague, right? Now, the, the judge was so messed up when she saw the argument. She was like, ah, I never saw this argument, but I have to let him in because he meets all of the procedural requirements. So she had to let me in. But she said, well, I'm going to let you in, but I'm going to deny you because even, even if I took the two points off for the obstruction of justice, you would still have life. So, and then my case went to the D.C. Court of Appeals. Now, the D.C. Court of Appeals was like, uh, the, you know, the, uh, uh, um, uh, the Federal Court of Appeals, they said, well, we're going to give you a lawyer for this, but this is a very complex issue. So the lawyer asked me, he was like, hey, man, when the hell did you come up with this issue? I'm like, I think I'm right. I've just read. I'm like, I read the issue and, and, and I think that I'm right. And uh, But, you know, it was it was enough to get me past all of the procedural hurdles. Now, the D.C., uh, the Federal Court of Appeals for D.C., they still deny me because they say the same thing. Well, guess what? Even if we took the points off for obstruction of justice, you would still have life. So on that basis, we're not even going to go into detail. We're just going to deny you on that point. But, uh, you know, it, it was just, but still, you know, being able to learn the procedures. So I knew, I said, eventually, uh, eventually, I'm going to back them against the wall. You know, and uh, and yeah, that you know, so that's really I learned procedures, and then when I learned procedures, everything that shit just blossom. 